I used Ket for about three months and I moved on to Crystal. My behavior was 100% like an addict. So I always used to hang around with like older guys, gangsters and things, and I used to look at them as role models in my life. I've also neglected my daughter for a very long time. Nelson Mandela said, it always seems impossible until it's done. Hello, I'm Khalil Osiris. Welcome to Each One Teach One. Addiction has many different impacts across communities, always negative, but sometimes facing up to the issues lessens the chaos of that addiction. I always introduce myself as a mom in recovery, recovering from being addicted to my son's addiction. My son has been an addict since the age of 14. He's 20 now. I remember the one morning um, he was lying in bed and he was complaining he had stomach cramps. But I just looked at him that morning and it was like an aha moment where everything just seemed like, you know, something was wrong. I looked at him, it looked like him, but his face had changed, he's lost so much weight. And that morning I remember taking him to a pastor in our community um, that deals with drugs and I took him there and they had him tested and he tested positive for almost all drugs. Okay, I was 14 at the time, I just went to high school. Always used to hang around with like older guys older guys like gangsters and things and I used to look at them as role models in my life. I always used to want to be like them. So that's when I was introduced to Cat in grade 8 and I think I used Cat for about three months and I moved on to Crystal. That very day that I found out that he tested positive, I booked him into the first rehab and I thought that day that that's the end of our problems. He went to rehab, I think he was there for about six weeks, doing well while he, while he was there. And when he came home, a couple of weeks later, it was back to square one. I was 15 and I went into my first rehab and I knew that I didn't want to stop drugs because I liked what drugs gave me at the time. It gave me a reputation, it gave me all of this fame with my friends. When I came out of rehab I stayed for about a few days clean and I went back into it again. He has been to centres, community organisations in the community. He's been to private rehabs, the very pricey ones. He's been to the government ones. He's been to um, church organisations, you know, for that sort of intervention. He's even gone to the military. You know, people said he needs the military. That's going to help. I don't know how many times I think I've lost count. Um, but when I, I, I've counted between five and seven rehabs that he's been to. Some of them were short-lived, some of them was like just three weeks he'd leave. The rehab that he went into, the one day he was there just for a day and he left. Every time I went to rehab for my personal reasons and it was like giving them false hope. Like they get excited, yeah, we're gonna give our son back, we're gonna have our brother back and all of that. But when I come back into Yaldarado Park, then I go to the corner and I stand with the guys that, like, doubt me the most. He became very abusive at home. Um, the swearing, the hatred, the rage in his eyes. I think many a times when he would come home without him even saying a word or without me even asking him anything, I would just open the door and look into his eyes and see the rage and, and the hatred. And he was just so aggressive where I would just step out of his way and know tonight I'm not saying anything to you. I'm not even gonna confront you or ask you where have you been as long as you're home. I'm okay with that. 
walking out of his room and saying to him, why did you sell this? Why did you sell the shoes that I bought you? And you'd walk out of the room and you'd just feel a shoe against your back. You know, he'll throw you with something. Everything was wrong at home. I wasn't speaking to my granny, I wasn't speaking to my mother. I could come home any time and when I just walked into the doors, everybody would go sleep because they couldn't like stand me looking like that and they would go sleep and when I would get up in the morning, I wouldn't greet anyone. And you don't realize that the rest of the household is suffering. I've also neglected my daughter for a very long time, you know, by putting everything and all my focus on my son, you know. My life became unmanageable. I didn't know if I would make it to work the next day because the previous night I'd be out looking for him. You know, we become like addicts as mums. You make loans with money that you don't have. You stay out of work. Addicts do that. You isolate yourself from family. Addicts do that. You stop eating. Addicts do that. You wake up in the morning, you shout and you scream and you just angry at the world. Addicts do that. You no longer wash your hair. It's always like tied up or you don't worry about putting on makeup and you just don't socialize and I realized that my behavior was 100% like an addict. Addiction is a community issue that needs a collective response. It needs to be led by individuals who have overcome the stigma and who wish to shine a light on the path to recovery. I looked around at the community and every second person that I speak to, you know, um, would tell me about either their daughter or their son being on drugs. You know, mums would say weird things like, I, I stabbed my daughter because she stole from me again this morning. My son's epileptic because of the drugs. You would go to a mum and a daughter would rush out at the flats here in Elders and she would throw the plasma TV down, you know, from upstairs. And because of the rage that the drugs put some of these kids in. And it was with that desperation and, and sense of hopelessness that I wrote that letter, um, I think it was early hours of a Sunday morning, and I said to him, Dear Dad, and I addressed the President as Dear Dad, because I believe that when you call on your father or your mom, you know, they drop everything and, and they come and they sort out their, their child. Dear Dad, Mr. President, I am addressing you in this manner because I need you to hear our cry as a dad and not president. The purpose of this letter is to inform you of the critical and dying state our children are in. I will press on until you read about us, the forgotten community of El Dorado Park and Cliptown. Our children feel trapped, and once they spiral downward in a whirlwind of addiction, they eventually commit suicide. So sad. From the very next day when the president was here, I opened up the curtains and I seen two boys sitting here and they probably thought that, you know, I can help them. And that's how it all started. And we would put them into the car, myself and a very good friend of mine, Alistair, and we would take them to, to rehab. And every day, every second day, drive kids like five, six kids up and down to Cullinan in Pretoria and just take them to rehab. His addiction, has really pushed me to do things that I that I would never have imagined me doing. You know, I love decor and fashion and all of that. And yeah, I find myself going into lolly lounges. Uh, lolly lounges are places where girls usually fre frequent and, you know, they sleep with guys to go get their next fix. Or it's just a hangout spot where everyone just goes and they smoke. Um, and many a times when the girls go missing, that's where we would find them in the lolly lounges. Um, sometimes when uh, things go missing from parents' homes, like the television gets sold or, you know, the kids would sell their wedding bands, I know the spots and we would go there with saps and go inside and, you know, go and find their stuff, their items in the community. I always say that, through his addiction, I have found my passion in life. 
At first, I didn't like that my mother was involved in the community while I needed a tour and maybe for a cigarette, but she's too busy in the community and stuff. But now I'm, I think I'm more open-minded and I accept what she's doing in the community because I'm the reason that she's doing it and she loved me so much to love other people that's using drugs just to try to help me. And In March this year, we launched the center, Sharing Without Shame. A lot of people ask me why Sharing Without Shame, because I know it's so shameful to share. Uh, and it was always my dream to have a center, to actually have a place to take these kids. And the center, there's various programs that we run there, and we mainly, we deal with at-risk youth. We want to try and catch the youth before they get more addicted. So there's different programs that speaks to different types of behaviors and the challenges that actually walks through the door. You, we find that a lot of these people have been using drugs since the age of 11 and 14 and now they're 20 and society puts so much pressure on them, go find a job. They have lost all those skills on how to communicate, how just to be, all they know is the life of addiction. So the center is not only a beacon of hope, but the center is a place where we empower we love, we try and have a model that's like a family just at home. It's, it's very laid back so that we, people just know how to interact and how to play games and, you know, they, they, they get to know who they are. They get to know what their favorite color is. They get to know what they like, what their hobbies are. So there's different programs, there's skills, there's arts and culture. There's so many things that happens at the center. My name is Llewellyn, uh, I'm a recovering drug addict, four months clean and sober now. I would just encourage the guys that we, we can achieve and we can conquer the, the, the substance abuse. And I want to tell you that recovery is possible and there is a life out there, a bright future ahead of us. It is a, a true honor to be here to join Darlene James in opening this, this center. Um, what she is doing is just amazing work. It's important work. But more than that, she's setting an example. She is a model for others. In, in September last year, um, I was privileged to actually visit five states and this was to do on how to deal with at-risk youth. I uh, was selected by the United Embassy, it's President Barack Obama's program that he has there and they usually have people that they think is like leaders in their country and can take their country forward and they nominated me to represent South Africa. So I visited Washington, New York, Seattle, Denver and I visited quite a few NGOs and NPOs and I've learned so much and it is with that information uh, that I came back and I implemented some of those programs that just sort of try and help our community. I think my mother is my pillow of strength because whenever I think about maybe if I'm having a bad day or something, I just think about what she had to go through with me being this rebellious child and me always wanting to prove a point to everybody and just being the selfish person. I just look at her and if I think that I'm having a bad day, I realize that no, she loved a life like that. So one bed, they won't get me down. No matter how difficult it is, you must get up and do what it takes, what's necessary to do. Even if it means helping someone else and just trusting God to help your situation. We, all of us, we have an important role to play. You might say, I don't know. I also didn't know. I am just doing. There's something that you can do, whether it's cleaning the street, whether it's taking another child to the zoo, but it's time that we all get our hands dirty and get involved and make a difference. As this month commemorates the 40th anniversary from the, of the 1976 uprising, I think the youth of today should learn from the youth of back then and take the same courage, love, determination to bring about a change against the new struggle that is destroying our country and that is drug addiction and take a stand and say no more. My daughter asked me, Mommy, but how can you say that this community will be drug free. I said, you know what? I believe in my heart it may not be tomorrow or the day after that this community will be drug free. Nelson Mandela said, it always seems impossible until it's done.
let's learn from one another. Well, it's great to be here, uh, Kaylin and Darlene. I'd just like to start with um, the ideal of being hopeful in the midst of a very difficult situation. I see you have uh, a yellow ribbon. Uh, what, what does that symbolize? Um, the yellow ribbon, you know, when I thought about the yellow ribbon, I thought there's a symbol for all diseases and where people actually wear it. The yellow ribbon symbolizes that I'm unashamed. I'm unashamed of my struggle. I'm unashamed of my son's addiction. I'm okay. Um, it symbolizes that there is hope. It also speaks to people to get involved, that every person, every citizen has what it takes to make a difference. It serves as a reminder for people to step out of whatever they stuck in and take the first stand. I know that you've done a tremendous uh, work in terms of community activism. And one of the things you did that was critical to building awareness around this issue um, is that you formed an organization, Sharing Without Shame. What was your intent with Sharing Without Shame? My intention, the organization actually started off right here in this lounge where recovery and wellness started in my home so I didn't wait for that building to come because sometimes that's difficult. So it was just about me opening up the door every day when addicts and mums would come in and this is where the organization started with no resource, no building and I would just write down everyone's details in a book and before you know it, um, you know, we moved we then took kids to, to rehab. I borrowed a friend's car, myself and Alistair, and we would take kids to rehab. Still no resources, but people would contribute towards fuel. And before you knew it, our pastor said, here's a building, you can use the building. So I still don't have money or funding, but today we have an organization and there's a building. I mean, I didn't even know how to organize a march, you know, for people to come. And you just send out a WhatsApp message to all your friends and you would say, meet me on the corner. We're gonna march through the community tomorrow. And with that, people come on board and people are, something's happening in the community. So it's about the little things that may seem to be insignificant to you and to others that has gotten us to where we are today. Oftentimes you'll hear uh, people complain the government isn't doing this and the government isn't doing that. And there's this whole kind of negative sentiment around whether or not the government is doing enough to address the issues um, of communities such as El Dorado Park. What are your sentiments about the Department of Social Development's uh, contributions and, and how have they helped you directly, for example? I think in terms of supporting many of the campaigns, um, maybe not financially, but in terms of guidance, I think when we understand that we are government, our constitution yes. says, the people shall govern. So it is about us not giving up and not doing the blame shift game and just keeping those accountable where we've gone knocking and making sure that they deliver. And an ordinary mother can do the same. Anyone can do it, anyone. You don't have to have the know-how, you don't have to um, have money, you don't have to have, I didn't have any of that. I still don't have any of that. I've lost a lot and my drive was, I'm not going to lose one more thing. You know, I grew up um, in a single household, only my mom, my mom and dad was divorced. I lost my dad recently, I got divorced, I lost my home, everything. You know, I resigned from my job because I couldn't keep up anymore with staying out every other day because I was too depressed. So I've lost a lot in life. I was done with losing things and I'm not prepared to lose anything else. And also, you know, me being an activist also helped me cope for the longest time ever because I knew I was helpless and powerless over my situation at home. But that doesn't mean I'm powerless over trying to help somebody else out there. How does having a mother who's so active um, and activist oriented in a, in a community. What do you see as a concrete role that you can play in supporting sharing without shame? I think uh, sharing without shame, I can play a role in it by just being clean. 
because it's open for anybody who just wants to recover and to be clean. And if I don't stay clean, I won't play a role in it at all. Nine months before, and I just relapsed again. So my primary purpose is to just stay clean because I'm, if, I, if I'm not clean, I won't be involved in it. How long have you been clean right now? 50 days. You've got 50 days. Yes. Congratulations. <laughs> Kayleen, what's your plan? I'm going to go back to school and to go write my matric and do my matric. And once that's out of the way, I'm going to study to become a pilot. OK. Uh, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about that. So I want you to reflect on what that would look like for you. And, and sometimes, uh, when your circumstances don't reflect your potential, you have to dream. There's a thing called dreaming. And that dream can be fueled by faith, but you still gotta dream. Your faith will get you through, but you still have to dream. You have to imagine something more than what you now have. I am grateful to have a second chance opportunity to have my son in my life. And the other night he was laying on the bed and he had all his clothes on. And before, you know, I would nag and say, get undressed, you can't sleep in that. And to me, it was just about covering him with another blanket. And it's okay, those things don't matter to me anymore. He matters. And... For you parents sitting out there looking at this show today, I hope you heard what she said about not sweating the small things. That the issue of addiction is about a person. It's about a loved one oftentimes. And she's responded with love in kind. What I hope you'll hear from the, today's interview is that no matter how disadvantaged you feel, you have an opportunity to make a difference. Don't allow your mess to keep you from developing a message.